Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives, and follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis using the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net. You can also uh, send uh, your check to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And I want to go ahead and thank Ross and Donna for supporting the program in that way. In addition, you can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go over to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, I do want to wish all uh, listeners who are downloading on the day of release a Merry Christmas. Today, we're going to get into today's episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. Uh, The original air date is October the 8th, 1950, and the title is Living Death. And I do want to uh, note that this episode is listener discretion advised. There is a term used in today's episode, which we have heard on the podcast uh, before, but which was not originally a racial slur, but had a very specific uh, usage. In modern uh, day, this would be considered a racial slur, so So again, listener discretion advised. Let's go ahead and get into today's episode. Presenting Joel McRae as Jace Pearson in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, authentic stories from their official files. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Living Death. It is 2 a.m. on the morning of October 3rd, 1948. A man stands in the brush on the American side of the Rio Grande, watching another man wading rapidly across the river from the Mexican side. Say you're green. Say you're green. Where are you? Over here. And shut up. Oh. Uh. I almost fallen. Never over. mind. You crazy wearing a white sombrero with that moon? What is the harm, say you green? Nobody see the ego but you. Don't be too sure of that. Somebody followed me down here. I don't know whether I shook him or not. The body patrol? No. Hijacker, maybe. You got the package? Oh, see. Right here. 20 ounces. Okay, here's your money. 200 an ounce. $4,000. Oh, gracias. Will be another shipment next week. Yeah, I know. I'll meet you here again on the 12th. Same time. And be a little more... You all right, amigo? Someone does follow you? Quiet. Son came from over there. He's moving this way. You'll have to crawl through that clearing first, and the moon's right on it. You gonna use a gun? What do you think I got it for? Keep quiet. There he is. Coming into the moonlight. Yeah, and he doesn't see us. Just like a sitting duck. Oh! You hit him, senor? Yeah. Oh. 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 It looks like I didn't oh. hit him good enough. Oh. Yeah, that's better. Grab his leg. Senor, Grab I his don't... leg and get him out of this clearing into the brush. The longer it takes to find him, the better. Uh, see. Oh. Senor Chris. <laughs> We shouldn't have met this place again. It will not be safe. All right, drop him here. No, we can't use this place again. It'll be too high. I must get back across the river. Where do we meet next time? Next time, use our old crossing. Near the us. I'll get lost. Fast! The 
body of the slain man was discovered. But for two months, there was no clue to point to his killer. And then suddenly another man was shot to death on the streets of a small town in West Texas. And Captain Stinson of the Texas Rangers radioed Ranger Jace Pearson to meet him at the county morgue. Bodies on this slab, Jace. Shot right through the heart, eh, Captain? Yeah. And here's our ballistics report. Forty-five caliber slug. Look at the markings on this photo of it. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, look at this ballistics photo. This is a report on the slug they took out of the man who was killed near the border two months ago. Yeah, I see what you mean. Both slugs came from the same gun. Mm-hmm. Autopsy report on this man completed yet? It's being typed up. We'll have it in a minute. Clyde Mooney's waiting for it. Mooney? Oh, is he here? Yeah, I sent for both of you. Mooney worked on the border killing. Since it's tied up with his second killing, I thought you'd better tackle it together. Suits me fine. You got some special reason for wanting to see the autopsy report, Jace? Yeah. Look at the body. Marks on the left forearm. Look like the kind we usually find on drug addicts. Well, we'll know in a second. Now, here's Clyde now. Howdy, Captain. Hi, Jace. Howdy, Clyde. Good to see you, boy. Heard you talking as I come in, Jace. You hit it, all right. Here's the autopsy report. Man was a drug addict. He's probably just as well off dead, then. Bullet ties this one right up with your border case, Clyde. Guess we're both after the same killer. Yeah. I've been hunting wetbacks for two months trying to find the man who was toting the gun no slugs came from. Anything else you boys want to see here? No, Captain. No, Captain. Well, let's get out of here, then. Any identification on this man we just saw, Captain? Not a thing. Was dressed like a hobo. Doesn't fit any of the descriptions on missing persons reports, either. Might help a lot if we knew who he was. I can't see this killing as a job done by a wetback. Why not, Jace? It was somebody sneaking across the border. Tracks weren't clear by the time the body was found down there, but there were tracks. Both your cars in back near mine? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Jace, go ahead with your theory. Well, a wetback sneaking into the country to earn a few dollars working is usually too poor to own a gun, unless he's carrying something across with him. You thinking of those hypo marks, Jace? It adds up to me. Narcotic smuggling. Might be. Man who was killed in my territory could have been shot because he spotted somebody crossing with the stuff. Well, that's possible. But how about the dead man we just left? He wasn't shot near the border. It looked like he was down and out. Had the habit, but not the price. Might have tried to get some narcotics by threatening to expose the peddler. I'll buy that, Jace. How about you, Clyde? Best bet I've had so far. All right, Jace. Where are you planning on starting? Back along the border. What, my area? No. Killing was made that spot too hot for them. They'll go back to some old crossing that's cooled off. I know a few, and you probably know a few. Well, yeah. Place west of Laredo. Then there's uh, Devil's River. That's been quiet lately. Yeah. And the Castellon area in the Big Bend, up through Lajitas and Redford. It's a big border. Yeah, so the sooner we get started, the more of it we can cover. You're dragging a double trailer, Jay. Suppose I load my horse in with charcoal. We'll use one car. Good. Let's go. Mooney and I covered the old smuggler crossings one by one. But weeks passed and we hadn't found anything by the time we reached the Big Bend. We were riding the river near Lajitas. Getting kind of late, Jace. We ought to make camp turn in. Yeah, might as well quit this spot tomorrow. Move on toward Redford. There's a good campsite ahead, clearing near that clump of honey mesquite. <laughs> You've got eyes like a cat. We can make radio contact when we get back to the car tomorrow. Captain may have something for us. Yeah. What was it he said he'd check on? Narcotic possession cases. Trying to pin down areas where the drug traffic seems to be the heaviest. Man who's smuggling narcotics must be picking up for a central distributor. Well, it could be just a small operator. A well, small operator's business wouldn't warrant the risk of crossing the border. Whoever makes the pickup is working for a boss. Well, why couldn't he be the distributor making his own pickup? A oh, big boy would play it safe. Stick somebody else's neck out, not his own. Ah, here we are. Ooh, who charged? Ooh, boy. Ah. You want to get the bed rolls off, Jace? I'll strike a fire, get some chuck cooking. No, no, let's skip the fire and eat cold. Well, why? We're moving out of here tomorrow. I'd like to watch one more night. It's too quiet here. There haven't been reports of any trouble in this section in almost three years. We haven't even spotted a wetback trail. Okay, no fire. Might as well let the horses drink before we hobble them. Come on, Charcoal. Come on, boy. 
I want to rub Charco's legs down tonight. Leche Gia's been cutting him up. Yeah, I got a few nasty scratches myself. Atta boy. Drink up. You looking for something over there, Jace? Yeah. Let the horses go for a second. Come here. Bring a flashlight. What is it? Slight depressions in this mud bank. Just barely saw them. Flash the light. Yeah. They were tracks, all right. Not much left, though. Something else here. A piece of paper half buried. Must have been stepped on. Hmm, brown. Looks like that brown stickum paper they use to seal packages. No. This is the kind of paper a bank uses to wrap money. Look. And traces of blue on here from an ink stamp. Yeah, can you read it? No. Maybe the lab at Austin can. Anybody who tore a band from a packet of money in this spot must have been counting it. Yeah, this isn't exactly a business neighborhood. Let's stake out, boy. We found some kind of a crossing, and it may be the one we're looking for. We didn't dare move out of the area. We took turns sleeping and keeping the horses out of sight as much as possible. At night, we crept out along the river, moving slowly under cover. Five nights now, Jace. Maybe they won't cross again in the same spots. I know. A mile above or below us, and we'd never even see them. We found tracks in a couple of places along here. They might... What? Oh. <laughs> One of our horses. Thought we had something for a minute. Clyde, that isn't one of ours. It's coming from the wrong direction. Put your ear to the ground. I don't have to. I can hear him coming now. Can't be our horses. They're hobbled, and the one we hear is moving free. Come on. Don't show yourself on the riverside. That's where his contact will come from. Coming now. There's something moving in the water out there. A few hundred yards down. Our horses would have to be up the other way. We'll have to try it on foot. We haven't time to go back and get mounted. They make a fast pass. We'll never get there in time anyhow. We'll have to risk a little noise. That moving horse will cover our approach until he stops. Step it up. The contact is across to this side by now. I can't see him out there anymore. Wait. Wait. The horse is stopping, too. Diego? Oh, here, senor. Come on, give me the stuff. Here's the money. Well, they're not wasting any time, Jace. No. Let's go. Stay where you are! Both senor! of you! Get going, Diego. Run! Get up, boy! I'll get the one in the river, Jace! Stop that horse! Come out of that water! Get him, Clyde? He, he shot at close range, Jace. I had to kill him. We got to leave him get after that rider. Let's get to the horses. You're right. Only we've been 50 yards closer to him back there, Jace. He went over the ridge up ahead. We can pick up his trail up there. I could swear I hit him when I fired. I hope you did. Narcotic traffic's the filthiest thing on earth. Oh, here's the ridge, Chase. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, oh Charco. Oh. Boy. Yeah. Look where we have to track. Uh, Mesquite and greasewood. Oh. Ground as hard as rock. Won't be much of a trail here, Jace. It'll take us hours to cut back and forth looking for soft spots. Yeah, no time for that. Get off. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be too bad if I didn't hit him. A blood trail's our only chance. Yeah. They'll find another contact for narcotics across the border. Sure they will. Unless we get to the man we're after. He's the only one who can lead us to the ring on this side of the border. And we've got to get to him before he gets rid of that package. Listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Today marks our first Sunday broadcast, and we sincerely hope that all our old friends who listen to us on Saturday night will be with us at this new Sunday time. Also, we extend a cordial welcome to our new listeners and hope that you'll be with us every Sunday at this time. Now we continue with tonight's case Living Death. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It 
We combed the ground for a blood trail, and we found it. Not much, but enough to follow. It led through the mesquite and greasewood, but the rider knew the country. He'd been weaving through the roughest spots. He's a smart one, Jace. Yeah, slowing us down all the way. Got a good hour on us by now. And an hour is too long. He's probably just using that horse to get to a car someplace. We can't waste any more time trail cutting them. No. He must have headed for cover someplace to take care of that wound. General direction seems to be northeast. We'll have to gamble on it. Okay. Let's ride. Get up, Charlie. After two miles, we reached a road and picked up the trail again. We had horse tracks to follow now, and they led to a dilapidated barn near a rundown ranch house. He was here, all right, Clyde. Blood in the hay and this torn cloth ripped a piece off his shirt to make a bandage. He knew this spot and headed right for it. Must have been here before. Yeah, but we're still way behind him. Mm. Main road's only a mile or so from here. He's gotten to his car by now. The ranch house is dark. Uh, let's wake him up. He might have seen something or heard something. Leave the horses here. Okay. This place sure has gone to seed, Jason. Yeah, it's a big house, but falling apart. Fences sagging, no stock. Must have been a nice ranch once, though. Uh, it isn't anymore. Man gets his living from the earth, you'd think he'd take better care of it. Here's the house. Open up. Hey, wake up in there. Who is it? Texas Rangers, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you. Just a minute. There was an electric power line to the house, but when she opened the door, she was carrying a candle. The inside of the house was almost barren. What do you want? We're looking for a rider. He came through here tonight. He stopped in your barn. You see or hear anything? No, I didn't. You rent out a horse to anybody? <laughs> a horse? Range, if I had a horse, I'd have sold him for food for my kids. Mm, sorry, we have to bother you, ma'am. It's all right. What difference does it make? You know anybody around who... Ma'am. Would you mind holding your candle over the mantel of this fireplace? Why? Jace. That picture. The picture was a photograph of a man. The face was younger, full and healthier than when we'd seen it last. But there was no doubt about who it had been. Jace, that's a picture of the man we saw with the cap, the body, and the morgue. The mo- oh, oh, no. Take it easy, ma'am. Take it easy. <laughs> ma'am, uh, I'm sorry. When? When did you see him? He can't be dead. He can't be. I'm afraid he is, ma'am. And you'll help us a lot if you'll tell us who he was. Jack Prentice. My husband. Oh, my poor kid. Oh, why didn't you report him missing? Because he left me two years ago. He'd sold and lost everything we owned. He was sick, half crazy, acting like a madman. I don't know why I didn't do anything. He'd never been like that before. You got any idea at all what started it? A friend of his. Jack was all right. He was a good husband and father till he took up with Virgil Green. Then he spent more time with him than he did with us. He must have been gambling or something. We had a good place here. Then it was all gone. This isn't going to be easy to take, ma'am. Your husband wasn't a gambler. He was a drug addict. Oh, oh, why didn't he tell me? I begged him to go to a doctor, but he wouldn't. When did you see him last? I told you, two years ago. When Virgil Green left him, Jack left right after him. You seen this Virgil Green since then? No. You know where Green went after he left here? No, but it must have been Chino. I got a couple of letters from Jack came from there. And then he stopped writing. Not even a word to his kid. Ma'am, I hate to leave you like this, but we'll see if we can get you some help later on. Nothing can help anymore. Not for me. But I beg for my kid. And you won't have to. You'll hear from us. Come on, Clyde. We got to get the boy who gunned her husband, Jace. We got to get more than one. We got to get them all. The whole ring. 
There'll be a hundred more like her husband, dying slower and worse than he did. You think this Virgil Green is the link? It must be. Fits the cards we've been playing. Jack Prentice couldn't raise money to buy from Green, threatened to expose him, and Green killed him. Then he killed the man near the border, too. Gotta try to pick up Green at Chino. He knew this place. It's a fair bet he's the man we've been chasing. Get up, Charcoal. Oh, boy. Taking him is gonna be a pleasure. We can't take him. Not until we find out if he still has that package. We better knock on these ponies until we get to our car. Yeah. Get up, Charcoal. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. got to the car, but before we headed for Chino, I put in a phone call to Captain Stinson. All right, Jace. I'll have a ranger plane pick up that bank wrapper and send it to the lab. It may be a bank in Chino. Well, that fits with a few other things. My checkup shows a heavy drug traffic in and around the Chino area, and the town where Prentice was killed is only 60 miles from Chino. Good. That narrows it down. Uh, see if you can dig up a Chino address on Virgil Green while we're driving up there. He's only two hours ahead of us. We can burn up road. We may reach there almost as soon as he does. Let you know by radio, Jeez. I'll head for Chino myself. Thanks, Captain. We'll see you there. We were less than an hour out of Chino when our short wave came through with Green's address. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead. Address of subject Virgil Green is Greendale Ranch, State Highway 39, 14 miles west of Chino. Got it. Any report from lab on bank money wrapper? Stamp on money wrapper restored by Austin Lab. Money and packet came from Chino State Bank, Corner Main and Crockett in Chino. 10-4, unit 10, clear. ADXA, Austin. That's all we need, Jace. Yeah. We can get Green in sight before he unloads that package. It was dark when we reached the Greendale Ranch outside of Chino. We'd made up time on Green's head start because we saw a car and horse trailer pull into the ranch just ahead of us. A man got out of the car and limped up to the house, and he was carrying a package. Walks like a man's been shot in the leg, Jace. Yeah. Don't turn in after him. Go on past the ranch. Okay. Where do you want to stop? Uh, where we can watch the house and keep the car shielded. Well, there was some heavy brush on the other side of the road just across from Green's place. All right. Turn around and go back. We'll keep an eye on him from there. We kept a watch on Green's house all night, but nobody showed to pick up the package. The next morning, Green came out and got into his car. We followed him into Chino. He's pulling into a parking space up near the next corner, Jace. Yeah, slow down. He's getting out. He's got the package, all right, sticking out of his pocket. Park here, quick. He's going into that building on the corner. Come on, before we lose him. Hey, the street sign, Main and Crockett. And he went in there, Jace. Chino State Bank. That's where the money wrapper came from. Don't go in. Just walk around the corner. We can look through the bank windows. There he is, Jace. Last counter, the rear of the bank. Safe deposit boxes. Going through the rail into the vault. Must have a box he's going to plant the stuff in. We going to grab him? No. Wait till he comes out. But he won't have it on him then. We got enough on him. We can pick him up any time. Got to stay with that package until we know who gets it next. Hey, he wasn't in there long. He's coming out. Yeah, the package isn't in his pocket now. All right, get out of sight, yeah. Right. He was in there just long enough to open up the box and drop it. Yeah, you've seen the package now. Drift around to the front of the bank. See that nobody leaves that vault with it unless you follow him. Okay, well, where are you going? To meet the captain and get a court order to open that vault. <laughs> We got the order. Then we waited until the bank closed and the employees were out. We got the president of the bank at his home and took him back to open the vault. Narcotics, eh? Most distressing, gentlemen. Oh, come in, please. 
All right. Which box is Green's? 421, right here. Want to open it for us? Why, of course. What? Say. It's, oh. it's empty. Now, couldn't you have made a mistake, Ranger? No. Clyde, are you sure that package wasn't taken out? Positive, Jace. I watched every single person went in or out till the bank closed. Our order covers the rest of these boxes, doesn't it, Captain? Yes. All right. Let's open them all. We found what we were after, but not the way we expected to find it. The stuff was there, all right, but it had been split up into smaller quantities. The owners of these boxes must be names you have on your list of dope peddlers then, Captain. I'll check that on the bank records. Yeah, but how'd this stuff get split up? Green wasn't in here long enough to do it. No, he couldn't have done it. His key would only give him access to his own box. You have to be done by somebody with a set of duplicate keys. Somebody working here. Well, that's impossible. Only the head cashier and I have duplicate keys. Well, were you in the vault after the bank closed? No, sir. I haven't been in here all day. That's the truth, Jace. I could see him through the window. And then the head cashier is our boy. He's the distributor. And a pretty clever distribution scheme, too. No direct contact, and he has access to the vault after the guard has left. If he's handled those packets, there'll be fingerprints on them. What's his name, and where does he live? His name is August Weber. He's got a big ranch over near Estrella on Highway 39. And I know how he got it now. He said he was making money on investments. Investments? He meant a black market in human souls. Come on, Clyde. Let's get him and Virgil Green. <laughs> found the house, an elaborate building on a fine ranch. There was another car in the driveway when we pulled up. Hey, Jace, that car in front of the place. Yeah, we're in luck. It's the car Virgil Green was driving. Light around the side of the house by that French door. Maybe they didn't hear us drive in. Good. Let's slip up on that side of the porch and find out. Might be able to take him easy. Uh, don't count on it. Cold-blooded killer like Green... He'd keep on killing as long as he has a gun. We slipped up to the French door. It was locked and we couldn't see through it. But their voices drifted out through an open window. I'm telling you, Weber, my leg's infected. I gotta see a doctor. Have him report a bullet wound. You want me to die? I could put a bullet in you, too. Well, let me know when you want to try. Then it'll kill him myself, Green. Only I've been smart about it. Nobody's caught me yet. All right, Clyde. Let's kick a hole in this door. All right. Don't move. Ranger. Don't reach. Uh, Clyde, you hurt bad? My, my side. You, you're hit too, Jace. Blood on your head. Uh, just a neck. Come on. I'll get you to a hospital. How about... How about them? Uh, leave them for the coroner. They're both dead. The gun found beside the body of Virgil Green proved to be the murder weapon the Rangers had been seeking. Narcotics peddlers having safe deposit boxes at the Chino State Bank were rounded up, and they admitted they had been supplied by August Weber. They were tried and sentenced. The traffic in living death was halted. Here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. A friend of mine returned recently from a visit to Texas. While he was there, he'd seen a Texas ranger, and he asked his host, a rancher, what the requirements were for a man who wanted to be a ranger. The host looked thoughtful for a moment and said, Well, I'd say if a man could ride like a Mexican, and trail like an Indian, and shoot like a Tennessean, and fight like the devil, he might have a chance to get in. Now, I hope you'll be with us again next week. Same time, same station. Good night. Next week, Joel 
Bill McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Barney Phillips, Larry Dobkin, Byron Kane, Ken Harvey, and Lillian Byam. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tuesday night on NBC marks the return of Baby Snooks, Problem Child Deluxe. Daddy will be on hand to keep Snooks in hand, but the impetuous Snooks will be fighting in the clinches. There's many a laugh in store for you Tuesday with Baby Snooks, so be sure to listen. And listen, too, for People Are Funny each Tuesday, the night for comedy on NBC. Stay tuned now for Celeste Holm, starring on Theater Guild on NBC. Welcome back. Well, the way that uh, the case went without any police intervention really does suggest that uh, had the uh, criminal not been foolish enough to keep the gun around and use it again, uh, this may not have happened in terms of an actual investigation. And it does give a clue as to why so many murders don't get cleared. Uh, because in this case, how is that going to happen? Because you're just dealing with a sort of wrong place, wrong time uh, situation. And, you know, in the past, you don't have the even near the number of cameras and places that are monitored to have even a, a chance of getting a clue. And even today, I think a killing that happened at a place like this would probably not be captured unless there was some uh, specific uh, surveillance going on in that area. Now, there was one part of the story that did really stand out, and that was uh, when Ranger Pearson suggests the drug addict who died was better off dead. Obviously, that's not the case because, you know, I think the saying where there's life, there's hope does apply. But I think what you had going on there was the attempt to uh, really convey to the audience how serious and how dangerous using drugs were, particularly uh, to children who would be listening to the program, and certainly there were quite a few. Uh, because, you know, the fact and the experience of so many law enforcement officers is that uh, if people do come back from the use of drugs, it is often a very long, hard, and slippery road. Uh, and it often takes years of their life uh, to a particular addiction. And in fact, ruins their quality of life. And so I think that particularly among a certain group of people uh, who wrote uh, programs, they had the idea, we've got to make a point of how seriously dangerous this is, uh, to the point that they may go uh, a bit too far. You know, particularly in the case of the question of someone being able to overcome a drug addiction, the problem with portraying that as a hopeless estate is that there are going to be people who try drugs and you need them to get help. Although it has to be said that the type of help available during this time may not have been on the same level as we have today. But I think it's always just a difficult balancing act for uh, creators to... Uh, really, you know, if you're determined this is a problem that I want to address on my program, to do it in a way that is honest, that does show the type of damage that is wrought. And I thought the example of uh, the woman who uh, 
Jace found on this dilapidated farm that had gone to pot because of her husband's drug addiction. I thought that really painted a powerful picture of this type of damage that drug addictions can do to people's lives. But at the same point, you don't want to go over because you can do things that are counterproductive. And also, if you are... Uh, not being totally honest and are exaggerating some facts that may uh, lead uh, kids who are listening to take your concerns less seriously when it comes to the whole topic in general. A at least I, I think that really started to become the case like in the 70s and 80s. So at any rate, an interesting episode. Now on to listener comments and feedback. And along with her donation, Donna sent along a lovely postcard. Uh, this one uh, is from uh, the Coldstream property uh, on the north flank of Mount Lola, which looks like some really pretty country there in California. And uh, she writes in, uh, thank you for hours of entertainment. I particularly enjoy Johnny Dollar. Well, thank you so much, Donna. I appreciate the uh, card, the comment, and uh, your donation. Uh, again, thanks so much for your support. Now it is time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day, and I do want to go ahead and thank Glenn. Glenn has been one of our Patreon supporters uh, since May of 2016, currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Again, thank you so much for your support, Glenn. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to rate and review wherever you download your podcast from. But that will do it for today. This is our last new episode of 2021. Next week, we'll be bringing you Boxing Week, Monday through Friday. And then uh, next Saturday, we will have our New Year's special. And then two weeks uh, from today, we'll be back with another episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, uh, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, wishing you a great Christmas season, a great Happy New Year, and we'll be back next time. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.